This is Dr. Jonathan Hansen. I'm the president of World Ministries International as well as Eagle Saving Nations. Go to my website, worldministries.org and see what Eagle Saving Nations is all about. But it's to have another great awakening in a nutshell. We've got to once again have the power of God come down. Christians go forth with power and authority. There needs to be a nationwide repentance or this nation is coming under judgment. Let me tell you, we've got to have another great awakening. Now, we're in our college chapel here at World Ministries International. Uh, this is a special service on a Friday night because we're in a parade tomorrow, all representing our Savior. So this is a special service. I'm, I'm going to be speaking on, we could classify it as God's personality, what our personality should be like, what the Lord wants it to be like, I've actually had a man named Pastor Tobias Nehemiah, who's worked with me since 1987. He was part of my church that we developed into a mega church in Kenya. And uh, he, I asked him to write an article on this area of God's personality. And I wrote an article. It's going to be coming out. If you don't get my free monthly pastoral articles, you can call 360-629-5248 or worldministries.org and request to be part of the free mailing list. Now, the first part, grace, mercy, and forgiveness. And I wrote, Father, forgive them. Grace, mercy, and forgiveness. The dictionary defines grace as unmerited, divine assistance, given to humans for their regeneration or sanctification. Virtue coming from God, approval, favor, or privilege. Grace, therefore, is the disposition to act or instance of kindness. Once again, coming to you live from our chapel here at World Ministries International, this is a live audience with children. On the other hand, mercy comes from the Latin word merced or mercies, which means price paid. It has a connotation of forgiveness, benevolence, and kindness. It is by God's mercy we do not receive the punishment we deserve because God's mercy extends His forgiveness when we repent of our sins. He is merciful and forgives us. The mercy of God. Sometimes we may pray, quote, God have leniency on my soul, unquote. Or sometimes we may proclaim, quote, God have mercy on me, unquote. Through all the ages, God's mercy is not only given to the children of Israel, but to all those who come to God and accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. God extended his mercy to Saul, who was later called Paul. He was the persecutor of the church. He hated Christians because he thought they were wrong. But on the Damascus road, God struck him with blindness. Despite being blinded, Saul continued to Damascus. He later repented of his sins and God restored his sight. God had mercy on him. God can have mercy on us when we come back to him. In the Bible, there's many exhortations of mercy. One example is found in Matthew 5, 7. Quote, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy, unquote. Also in Luke 6, 36 through 37, quote, be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. And in verse 37, we read, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you'll be forgiven. You know, this is very important, ladies and gentlemen. I know you can read it. I know we can speak it, but... You need to understand we must do it. All of this will give you peace. All of this will give you joy. All of this will create unity in. And if you don't do it, you are destroying yourself. Your emotions, your mind, you'll be a basket case. and You actually open doors for demons to torment you. We must not only receive mercy from God, we must give mercy to others. Mercy extends farther to acts of compassion in which lend a hand to the needy around us. 
Allow me to mention this by saying, from, name withheld, quote, rivers do not drink their own water, the sun does not shine on itself, trees do not eat their own fruit, flowers do not spread their own fragrance for themselves. Nature is an example of living for others. We are all born to help each other, no matter how difficult it is. Life is good when you are happy, but much better when others are happy because of you. I hope you caught that. Life is better when others are happy because of you. Not just, you're happy. Well, you can be happy, but that sort of can be a real selfish thing where we don't care about the other person being happy. We need to care. God extended his act of mercy to us. Therefore, let us also love, forgive, and care. Dear brethren, we deserve nothing good from God. God does not owe us anything. The good we experience from God is the result of the grace of God, Ephesians 2.5. Grace is simply defined as unmerited favor. God favors us. He shows us approval and kindness in blessing us with good things that we do not deserve and could never earn. Common grace refers to the blessings God bestows on all mankind, regardless of their spiritual standing before Him. Well, saving grace is that special blessing whereby God sovereignly bestows unmerited divine assistance upon His elect for the regeneration and sanctification. Now, the forgiveness of God. We are to forgive like Christ has forgiven us. As I bring this discussion to a close, again, as I shared two articles, I wrote one. I asked Pastor Tobias to write one. They'll be going out in my next pastoral article. Now, I've been reading from his article, although I've been expounding a little bit on it, sharing it, embellishing it, unwrapping it a little bit. But... The key to a healthy relationship with God is to love other people. Amen. To love other people. That's the key to a healthy relationship with God. You cannot be angry with your brother and say you love God. I hope you caught that. There's a problem. Because we're supposed to extend mercy and grace immediately. And when we extend our anger prolonged, we need to repent and let God restore our joy. Jesus said that this is one of the two important commandments. Quote, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 22, 37 through 40. When we love, it does not mean we will not be disappointed by people. Yes, we may be disappointed, but we have to bear with other people. In fact, if you love other people, you will be disappointed. You have to be disappointed because they're not perfect and you've got to want the best for them. So if they don't perform like they could, you're disappointed. God's disappointed in us. But God doesn't condemn us. He doesn't blow us off. He doesn't reject us. He doesn't hold bitterness against us. And we need to do the same for other people. We need to put up with other people's faults, differences, and quirks. It means showing compassion, love, tolerance, gentleness, and patience. It also means not commenting every time someone does something wrong. You know, not commenting. Some people, you know, they're so sarcastic. They, they just sarcastically talk or under their breath. I mean, my goodness. That's very irritating. It's very disappointing. It's very discouraging. It's very even depressing. Can we operate with the joy of the Lord? Can we forgive? Can we love? Can we have compassion? Can we be tolerant? Can we be patient? 
As I conclude, may I draw your attention to the portion of the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, 3. Quote, And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not love, it profits me nothing. All we do by the grace of and through the mercy ministry, we must do all because of the love of God. And the love God has bestowed upon us in while we were yet sinners, God sent his son to die for us. While we were yet sinners. While we were his enemies. He gave us his most important possession. His enemies. He gave his enemies his most important possession. Eternal life. If they would receive his son as Lord and Savior. But to do that, his son had to die, had to suffer. We couldn't earn our way. God had to give it, and he gave it. All we could do is receive it and repent. God sent his son to die for us. May we live to please El Shaddai by his grace, mercy, forgiveness, and crowned it all with love. Again, I preached it. The notes came from Pastor Tobias. Now, this is my portion of the article. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them, were the words spoken by Jesus as he was hanging and dying on the cross. The Romans who crucified him and the religious leaders who encouraged Pilate to pronounce his death sentence were present at the crucifixion site. Jesus' enemies heard him pray to God to forgive them. Jesus' words seem to sum up what a Christian's attitude is supposed to be. I hope we're really focused on the cross. Father, forgive them. Some people have a hard time forgiving their friend. What about days of spitting in your face, torturing you, whipping you, stripping naked you, hanging you on a cross? Just think what your attitude might be. I know what it should be, but that doesn't mean it is. Because I just watch people who get upset with a friend. Not yet an enemy. Yeah. 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 Jesus' words seem to sum up what a Christian's attitude is supposed to be. Luke 23, 34. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. So picture it. Here's the cross. Here's his enemies. Here's the religious leaders all around watching him, humiliating him, teasing him, mocking him. And Jesus says, Father, forgive them. These are his enemies. Russell Bradley Jones, author of the book Gold from Golgotha, states, quote, this prayer is not a request for a blanket pardon or cancellation of the penalty of all sins of all those who were at the cross. So catch it. It's not a blanket pardon. But it is, as I will explain, a postponement of justice. Postponement. So mercy and grace can be there so one can repent and not be eternally damned. No, instead it's a statement showing the grace of God because of the love of God that Jesus had even for his enemies that tortured him and were killing him at that very moment. This is the love we're supposed to extend to others because of grace. Are you with me? This is the love we're supposed to extend to others. Certainly to friends and family, but... These are your enemies. Now, 
Now this is the personality and attitude a Christian is supposed to have. Quote, also, such a request would have been inconsistent with divine justice and human free agency, unquote, for a blanket pardon. It's not a blanket pardon. It's a postponement in hopes that a person will repent. Jesus never granted pardon except to individuals on a petition of faith. Just as he did to the thief on the cross who repented to Christ. Jesus told him, today you will be with me in paradise. Why? Because he repented and accepted him as Lord and Savior. Jesus has never granted a mass pardon to a crowd of non-repentant sinners, regardless of their ignorance or guilt, but neither does he hate them or want vengeance on them. We're not supposed to hate our enemies, and there are enemies out there coming against the church today, and it's only going to increase, but we're not supposed to hate them. Jesus loves them and wants them to repent before they die so they can avoid eternal judgment, which is the part of justice of God that hates sin. God hates sin. There will be eternal justice if you don't repent before you die. There will be eternal judgment. He has to. It's the grace of God that when we sin, when we've had so many warnings and we know what sin is and we know what we're doing is wrong and yet we live, that's the grace of God that he doesn't just strike you dead on the spot. What is the grace of God? That he still gives you time. Jesus loves them. He wants them to repent before they die so they can avoid eternal judgment, which is the part of justice of God that hates sin. God is just. If we don't repent when, before we die, we have eternal judgment, and there is no mercy anymore. It's over. After death, there is no more. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. It's over. They've had a lifetime to respond to the grace of God and repent. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 1 and other places <clears throat> that all men have an opportunity to know Him and follow Him. All men do. Jesus is basically saying, quote, Father, give them a chance to repent. Do not allow your angels to destroy them right now to save your son. Jesus was requesting that condemnation of their sin be held in abeyance until they might know the true meaning of what they are doing. It was not a request for cancellation of the consequences of guilt, but a request for the postponement of the consequences. People who know and deliberately sin, they think God is overlooking it. He is not. He's giving you grace to repent before you die, and then there will be hell. And no more mercy. It's a postponement of justice or eternal death. A postponement. The people present were amazed by Jesus' prayer as they knew far too little about forgiveness of injuries. As Jones writes, quote, the Romans worshipped revenge as a God. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, blood for blood was part of a Hebrew ethics. Even though grace, mercy, and forgiveness are throughout the Old Testament, these purely religious people who were not really following God in their heart, use only portions of the Scripture to live by. They cherry-picked. They picked portions. 
Not in context. Well, this is how Christians do it today. They cherry pick. God said this, yeah, and he also said this. They use these cherry pick scriptures such as an eye for an eye to penalize their enemies. This is not the attitude of a true follower of God. Instead, as Moses pleaded God, do not destroy them. That's mercy and grace. God did not destroy King David with premeditated adultery and murder. The law said kill him, stone him. All through the Old Testament, there are cities of refuge for mercy and grace. They wanted Jesus to stone the woman caught in adultery. All through the Old Testament, mercy and grace is given as an example. So they're cherry picking these specific scriptures out of context to condemn their enemies. My definition of grace is time given. When the Spirit's in the body to judge yourself according to the scriptures. When the Spirit leaves the body, grace is over. And now God, Jesus, judges you according to the word of God. Time given when the Spirit's in the body to judge yourself. We can all judge ourselves. Again, if, if Jesus, without grace, just judged us when we deliberately sin, probably nobody here would be in this room. You'd be in hell. Fried alive like crispy critters. You'd be worse than french fries under a bonfire. Acts 20, 32. So now, my brethren, I commend you to God and by the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I commend you to God and the word of his grace. Grace, grace is all through the word of God. All through the word of God is grace. King David understood that. Let God judge me. Because the law... The Mosaic law said, kill him. David was an adulterer. He was a murderer. This shows you, you know, I don't think anybody in this room has committed premeditated murder. And so if God can forgive David, he can forgive you. But David wasn't a fool. He knew he needed to repent. Or he knew God would judge him anyway. Because God cannot tolerate sin. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. God understands us. God became man. He understands us. Wow. Wow. People say, you know, you have to walk in my shoes. God walked in your shoes. Oh, God doesn't understand. You don't understand. You have never been tortured and maligned and rejected and hung on a cross like he was. Your piddly little problems with friends and foe that sometimes you have a hard time repenting and forgiving. Don't tell me God doesn't understand. You don't understand God's personality or the character of God, which we're supposed to be. We haven't put on the full armor or walk in that measure of faith. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, self-control. This is the character of a Christian. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but in all points tempted as we were, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We go boldly to Christ, don't we? You might be afraid to go boldly to your friend or your spouse or your enemy, but you don't have a problem going boldly to Christ. Thank God, because you know he doesn't condemn you. 
But that's how we're supposed to be without condemnation to others. The way you go to God, others are supposed to be able to come to us and say, sorry. That they may obtain mercy and find grace in time of need. 1 Peter 4, 8. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Hey, did you hear me? Love covers a multitude of sins. I know Sharon and Dan. Dan's with the Lord right now. But I'll guarantee you they understood love covers a multitude of sins. That's why they were together for such a long time. Love covers a multitude of sins. Love. It covers it. It's like you never did it. Galatians 5, 22 to 24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. Against there is no law. What is law? Sin and death. When you exhibit these things, there is no sin. You don't have sin. And those who are in Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Meaning now, every time we mess up, we say, sorry, God. And we're white and clean again. Because he doesn't condemn us. Man, I wish people did this. Quit condemning. Forgive. Mercy, grace, and love is supposed to be the personality, the attitude, and the characteristic of followers of Jesus Christ. Let us truly represent our Lord so Jesus can be seen through us on earth. And salvation and restoration can be part of our daily lives. May God bless each one of us. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're watching this, again, the warning television program, my website, worldministries.org. First of all, I'm concerned for your salvation. If you, if you don't know this Jesus, if you want your sins forgiven, if you're all confused and depressed, just say, God, forgive me. The Word of God says He will right now. He's not like other people. He'll forgive you. Telephone 360-629-5248. We'll send you Christian literature. We'll be glad to pray with you. But if you mean what I just said in your heart, the Lord Jesus Christ is... In, he's coming right now to reside, and now you start to follow him. We do need your help. This program costs money. So again, uh, worldministries.org, worldministries.org, you can give, or 360-629-5248, and you can give. But we do need your help to stay on this local television, radio station. Let God's personality be in you. Remember the words, Father, forgive them. God bless you.